I have spent some time with this guy now. This is the Mono Duo, and I've taken some images with it, and I've got some impressions to give you. Basically, this is a review, and it's going to be an imaging review of it. The guiding aspects of this, you know, does it guide through narrowband filters and so forth? I actually already did a video about that, and I torture tested this thing beyond scenarios that I think anyone will ever ever have to attempt with a camera like this. So I would encourage you to go watch that video if you're interested about the guiding of this. Because a lot of people have said that this camera will never work, but it does, okay? And I kind of proved that in that video as extensively as I thought I could. So anyways, let's get into my imaging review. Okay, so I think the first topic that I want to cover with this camera and doing a review about it is covering like, like cable management because Let's face it, with a model camera, things are a little bit more complicated. Not a lot more complicated, but they are a little bit more complicated. And you now have a, an additional cable that you have to worry about, one that powers your filter wheel and runs the filter wheel, and so forth, and then runs back into the camera. And this guy right here, me being a person who also has a colored duo version, which is right here, I can certainly appreciate the fact that there are just fewer cables in general with these cameras, because I have, I have those of you who know my channel, you know that I have multiple different rigs, multiple different setups, and multiple different cameras. And I like swapping gear this way and that way all the time. And the fact that these duos, both of them, have fewer cabling involved versus some of the other cameras that I have, most notably my 1600mm, my 294mm, uh, my 178mm, this guy too, this is an Orion G21. Yeah, I have fewer cables with these duos and that is really something that I've enjoyed because it makes swapping quick gear around faster because I do like changing my gear up quite a bit. <laughs> I've done many different types of guiding. I've used off-axis guiders. I've used regular guide scopes along the main, main telescope and so forth. And then of course I've used both these duos now. The guiding of these cameras is so much better than any other way of guiding that I really don't think that I will ever want to go back to a regular type camera that is a non-duo. Which I know I'm kind of giving away the conclusion of my video here, but yeah, I. I basically am totally happy with these things, so happy in fact that, yeah, I don't ever want to buy a single chip Astro camera ever again, just because, well, they're, they're seamless, simple, and easy, and this, this hobby's hard enough as it is, I don't need things that make it harder, <laughs> okay? Anything that makes it easier, I am totally for. The next thing that I want to kind of cover is actually the sensitivity of these cameras. So for a long time, like I've, I've had this guy, I think getting close down to two years. I, I got this like as soon as these came out, the color version of the Duo. And one of the things that I noticed almost right away when, when comparing it to this guy here, because this was the only other one shot color camera that I had at the time. This, this is an Orion G21 with an IMX269 sensor in it as I noticed that the hydrogen alpha sensitivity in the Duo or the MC2600, it was actually a little bit less than I was expecting, which surprised me because these cameras have bigger pixels and they also have a higher quantum efficiency. It's, it's supposed to be almost 10% more, now, although it can be 5% based on batch to batch overlap because from one camera batch to the next, you can have a 5% difference in quantum efficiency, guys. Anyways, I noticed that the Orion G21, basically it was on a par, if not even sometimes a little bit more sensitive than my IMX2600. And, and there's another gentleman here who's, whose name I'll be putting up here soon, but he has done some tests on his own channel and he, he compared it to the IMX 294mm uh, ZWO camera, which, which is actually an IMX 492, but you know, they changed the name just for marketing reasons, like everybody else did. <laughs> and anyways, he found that that camera was, you know, a little bit more sensitive than these guys were. Now, what does that mean, okay? 
there is a ton of hydrogen alpha data out there, guys. Hydrogen alpha is so freaking abundant in the universe that that is not really a concern. However, if you're doing narrowband and you're doing sulfur, sulfur is right next to hydrogen on the transmission spectrum. And so then it kind of becomes a little bit of an issue because it means that you basically are going to be taking more sulfur data than you normally would. Now, it's not a humongous difference, but eh, it's something that's there. And it's definitely been tested and measured by other channels to show that this is actually a real thing. Okay, let's get into the imaging aspect of this camera and kind of what do I think about it. Now, first off, this camera is, and actually let me turn it a little bit so you can kind of see it a little bit better. This camera, it's 26 megapixels and it produces a pretty hefty file, which does take quite a bit longer to process than anything else I've been used to. And it's also a 16 bit file, which means there's a lot of depth in it. And one of the things I kind of had to get used to with both this camera and the 2600 color version of it that I have is that it, it feels like it has almost infinite well depths, which I mean, they're not infinite, obviously, but you can really take a long exposure with this camera and stars won't grow terribly large amounts on you. And that's kind of a cool and wonderful thing because I like going after a lot of really faint targets and the fainter stuff that's out there often requires 600 second exposures in order to, you know, get anything. <laughs> Now, another interesting thing about the data that this thing produces is that it does not have any amp glow, which is actually a wonderful thing. And I have never experienced uh, processing narrowband images without amp glow before, or at least it hasn't had to be calibrated out. This Orion G21 here and then the 2600MC color that I have were both color cameras, but they don't have amp glow and they were kind of actually pretty easy to process because they don't have the amp glow. You know, it's just one less thing that you have to worry about. You know, if you forget to take darks or you don't have a set of darks handy, you can go ahead and start stacking and start experimenting with the data before you go ahead and finish things off, which is actually how I kind of started this thing. I did some image processing with it uh, without any darks and so did some of the other people that helped me with this project. And then later on, I went and did darks and, you know, kind of calibrated and got even more data out of the picture, or at least I made the, the data look even cleaner. Okay. So yeah, this camera, it performs great. Now it doesn't, you don't see as big an improvement in your data when you do darks as you do with some of the older cameras that I've done in the past. Like for example, the 1600 mm uh, mono that I have, which was my very first camera, now it has some very, very slight amp glow in it, which actually kind of looks almost natural. You can actually get away with not taking darks. But anyways, it benefits tremendously from having darks taken and, and they're therefore removing that noise using dark calibration frames. This guy here, yes, he still benefits from it, but not quite as much as some of the older cameras do. And I think a lot of that just has to do with, number one, it doesn't have any amp glow, and number two, it is producing more a, a, nor, a more noise-free image overall. So next, okay, I'm gonna show you some pictures here and they're, they're gonna kind of go up on screen. So I'm gonna move over a little bit here. And I'll, I wanna show you first, this is the cave nebula, okay? And and first I'm gonna show you that this is a picture that, that Mark did for me. I had three other people help me take this data, process it, and give me three different interpretations of it. And you're gonna see a slideshow at the end of the video with all three of their interpretations. But anyway, it's Mark, Nas, and Rich, okay? And I will have links to their YouTube channels too in the description below. Anyways, first, the, the first one that he did was what's called a, a pixel math type image. And if I'm understanding pixel math correctly, it's not it's nothing I've ever done, but what it does is it, it essentially uses a database to kind of shift the colors in an image that are narrow band, that are done in a narrow band, and tries to make it look like a natural RGB image that your eye would that you would see with your eyes. Okay, and I don't like it. 
<laughs> I, I mean, I, I like Mark's processing. I just don't like pixel math, okay? I, I actually, I really haven't seen any pictures done with pixel math that I liked, and I could probably do a video as to why I don't like it in more detail, but I'd probably have to research it first. Anyways, so yeah, pixel math, that's what it looks like, the pixel math. So yes, with a narrow band camera, doing narrow band imaging, you know, the beauty of it is that you're light pollution proof, but if you really want to, there's software out there that allows you to take files from this thing and kind of make them look like a one-shot killer image so that, you know, it looks kind of pleasing to the eye in a natural sort of sense. Now, uh, the next picture that I'm going to show you here, this, this is, again, the Cave Nebula. And uh, one more fun fact about this thing. Uh, when some of the guys looked at this data, like, they actually didn't know what target it was. <laughs> And uh, for two reasons. Number one, they weren't used to seeing that much nebulosity in the images. But you know, I, I was doing a lot of 600 second exposures for this data. And also they weren't used to seeing it as quite as close up because I am using kind of a bigger scope for this. Uh, you know, yeah. And it seems like all the targets that I do, I always wish that I had a larger field of view, which, which is one of the nice things about having a larger sensor like this, is that you know you get a little bit larger field of view than you do over some of the other sensors that I've been using. This, this right here, this is a narrowband SHO, so sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen, and sulfur is mapped to the red, hydrogen is mapped to the green, and oxygen is mapped to the blue channels. And what you will notice is that it's kind of all green. <laughs> That's because 99% of the universe is hydrogen, folks. So what we often do, and this is what I love to do with my narrowband images, is, is do something like this. And this is the exact same data, just basically shifted, essentially. And what shifting it does is it brings out a lot of different layers that are kind of hard to see. And this is the beauty of narrowband is that this, this is what NASA does, okay? Any, any picture you've seen from Hubble is SHO, but it's shifted, okay? And the shifting essentially brings out the blues and extenuates the reds a little bit more. And, and basically it, it shifts them around enough so that your eyes can kind of interpret the data. And if you have a enough of a scientific mind, you can look at this picture and say, oh, those regions of space are warmer. Those regions of space are cooler. That section is expanding. This one's contracting. There's some wind blowing that section through space right here. And, and these are all things that you can see with narrowband imaging that you really can't see with a one-shot color camera like this. With a one-shot color camera, you're just going to get a pretty picture. You're not going to actually get the story of what is going on in space. And that's what I love about narrowband imaging is because I can look at a picture like this and I can see what's happening. I can see how the stars are forming. I can see how the gas is expanding. You know, all, all these, I can see what clouds are in front of what clouds and which ones are behind the others and et cetera and so forth. You know, there's just you know, all this cool stuff here, you know. So uh, I'm gonna show you one more picture here. And this is the Flaming Star Nebula. And, and then I'll just roll a slideshow. But basically the Flaming Star Nebula, this is a pretty cool one. Now this is not one that I shifted or anything like that. This is just straight SHL. But basically right in the middle of this picture, there is a star, which you can see, it's, it's not the biggest one in the picture, but it is the one that is right in the middle of this nebula. And it's a very bright star. And it is basically caught basically scattering or putting light on all the clouds that are around it. Okay. And you can see uh, over top of it, the way I've got it oriented, there's like, there's almost like this roof of clouds above it. And you'll see these nodules and these thick points and these ripples and so forth. And a lot of those channels and nodules and, 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 and almost like uh, chimneys or smokestacks as we often like to call them, are the birthing place of stars. So there are, there are, you can actually see where stars are being birthed within this, this hydrogen gas that's in space. And then kind of on the, on the right side of the image as you're looking at it, you can see that there's this long section that's kind of getting kind of blown, so to speak, by solar wind. It's being blown downwards in the, in the way that I've got the picture oriented. But, you know, that's, that's solar wind, kind of like basically kind of like pulling pieces of this, this 
this nebula away from it. So that, that's just kind of the, the cool stuff that you can see with narrowband that is a lot more difficult to like interpret and understand using a one-shot color camera. And that's what I love about mono cameras and the ability to shoot with narrowband is I can see the story of the picture, you know? And I'll give you another example. It'd be like if I was to go back in time, 300 years, and let's say I took a picture of some Native American Indians. And then I came back in time and I put it in Photoshop and I removed all their clothes and I put modern Gucci brand clothing on them and gave them all haircuts and Photoshopped all the paint of their fa on their faces off and made them look like 20th century people. Well, I would basically ruin the picture because the historicity, the story of those characters, you know, the, the, the experiences that they've had that would be shown in their faces would be gone. And, and that's how I feel a one-shot color camera kind of treats space, is that it, it shows a, a bit of an unbalanced, if you will, and, and I mean, granted, it is actually truly balanced, but it's, it's not telling us like chemically what it is that it's going on in space. And with narrowband, we can kind of like see through all the smoke and actually see what's going on. All right, and that's that's the beauty of it, and I just can't emphasize that enough. That's why I absolutely love narrowband, and I must say that I have a one-shot Keller Duo 2600 MC, and it's getting a lot less use. Actually, it's getting virtually no use ever since I got this mono version, because you know this guy is just so much more versatile, you know. And that's yeah, okay. I need to stop praising narrowband here, but anyways, okay. Let's roll the slideshow. I hope you enjoy these pictures. This is a really awesome camera. Let me summarize a couple of things. Like I said earlier, after using a duo camera like this, you know, the guiding in it is so much better that I really don't think I would ever go back to something like a single chip uh, camera ever again. And yeah, I, I hope that I hope that there are some smaller chipped cameras like this that come out in the future so that I can use it with uh, some of the scopes that I have that have like a smaller image circle because there are quite a few out there that like you need a big image circle to work with this guy. Uh, that's something else I might kind of like uh, caution people at is that you need to make sure that you at least have a large illuminated image circle. So enjoy the slideshow.